Um, thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming on such a horrible, wet day. Um, so I'm going to have to put my other pair of glasses on because I can either see you or I can see my notes, and I think it might be safer to actually be able to see the notes. So. Yeah, so Fashion for Nature opened to the public on the 21st of April, so we're just into our second week. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the exhibition, and then really I'm going to concentrate on um, the help that I've had from the Linnaean Society of London. But in doing so, I hope that that will give you a little bit more information about what you might see if you come to the exhibition. So um, the exhibition... Uh, looks at the very complicated, um, quite bittersweet relationship between fashion and the natural world. So fashion derives great inspiration from the world around us, from nature. Uh, it's an enormous source of creativity um, for fashion designers and textile designers. And the, um, the materials and designs they create, of course, reflect our human interest, our interest in nature, our human enjoyment of nature and the way we, we want to realise that in clothes. But also it's a story of exploitation, of plundering of the natural world. Um, and every single thing that we are wearing in this room um, came in some way from the planet on which we live. So fashion, complete fashion, the clothing industry, completely relies on the earth for um, all its raw materials, uh, for water, which is an increasingly precious resource, of which the fashion industry uses huge amounts, and for energy. Uh, and although some companies are going over to alternative energy uh, supplies, um, mainly uh, most, in, uh, most of the industry uses fossil fuels. Um, so the exhibition spans quite a long time. It starts in 1600, and it is the first exhibition um, ever in the world, I gather, uh, to look at today's issues around sustainability in a long historical context, but I'm a 19th century historian, and that's quite important to me. And so my job as a curator, or one of the, my jobs, is to create a narrative um, to explain how, as the industry has grown in scale um, and complexity, uh, so the impact of the fashion industry on the planet has uh, grown at the same time. Um, and shockingly, um, the fashion industry today is uh, ranked among the top five worst polluters in the world. And some would say, uh, in fact many say, that it is the second most polluting industry in the world, which is quite shocking when you, um, think, about it, well, when you think about it. However, the exhibition also looks into the future. Um, it links past, present and future. And at the very end of the exhibition, you can see some rather scary, I think, scenarios of what fashion might be like in 2030, 2030 but alongside them, we've got some prototypes of um, new ways of um, making and producing um, our clothing, which are much greener and cleaner um, and better for, better for the world. So um, I've seen a lot of journalists over the past few weeks, and they asked me two questions. The first one is, why now? Well, to a degree, it's serendipitous. Um, I proposed this exhibition in 2014 um, when I was aware of um, issues around the industry. Um, but I think over the succeeding two years when I was working on another project, I became far more acutely aware of them. And whereas originally I was going to concentrate more perhaps on the inspired by, the pretty side of it, which I knew visitors would come and see, I decided in the end I had to be brave um, and I had to look actually primarily at the issues around uh, the environmental impact of the industry. Now, the industry has a huge social impact too and always has, um, particularly in my period, the 19th century. Um, but it was deemed that was too big a subject for the space that the exhibition's in. So maybe in the future, certainly a good subject for a book. Um, and then a lot of journalists said to me, I now feel guilty when I look at a dress with a beautiful floral print on it. Why did you decide to do both? And I said, well, I have a very simple reason for that. Um, I think if we are going to change our mindsets and our practices and our behaviours, um, or even think about it, we have to remind ourselves why we love nature, why we value nature. Uh, why, like the man on the screen, the, man, the unknown botanist on the screen, we might choose to wear a floral waistcoat. We need to remind ourselves of that. Now, talking of floral waistcoats, um, in, my, in um, my desire to keep uh, this nature in the, in the picture, 
Um, I have got cases in each of the chronological sections which look at the way in which um, fashion uh, has been inspired by nature. And the first case, from the, which covers the 17th and 18th centuries, is called Drawn from Nature. And fellows of the Linnaean Society were extremely helpful to me in curating Drawn from Nature. And what the case looks at is the ways in which um, pattern drawers um, used natural history books in the 17th and 18th centuries as a, a source material for motifs and for their designs. Um, this was a time, as you know very well, when um, through exploration and trade, we were learning in Europe more and more and more about the world. Um, we, we were flooded with information. And uh, there were more publications seeking to bring that uh, to uh, pub public knowledge, but also to order it. And this, of course, is where Linnaeus is hugely important in um, cataloging um, and ordering nature. And one of the most, um, direct, well, the direct link in the exhibition with Linnaeus is this fan on the screen. Um, now, it's called the Botanic Fan, and it was published by Sarah Ashton in London in 1792. So fan makers published fans at that time. And she was prolific. She was a very important female, obviously, publisher of fans. Um, and it is printed um, on its face and on its reverse, and you've got the face here, and it's got rather nice boxwood, boxwood sticks. And I don't really need to tell you what the image is of, because you will all know. Um, so um, we have the um, we have uh, leaf shapes um, with forming uh, borders to the central depiction of flowers, and um, we the diagrams. Um, underneath the leaf shapes at the top, of course, show the arrangements of stamens and pistils, um, which, um, each of which represented one class of plant reproductive st structures, as described by Linnaeus. And on, they each have a Roman numeral underneath them, and on the reverse, we have a key to them. But on the back is the interesting bit, in a way. Well, not for another, also interesting. So we have a stanza from Erasmus Darwin's uh, Botanic Garden. Now, on the wall here, we have a portrait of Charles Darwin, and Erasmus, if I think I'm correct in saying, his grandfather. And he also was very interested in evolution. But he was a massive fan of Linnaeus. And um, during the 1780s, the Litchfield Botanical Society, which I'm told only had three members, um, Darwin... Um, Brooke Boothby and somebody else, um, they published um, English translations of the um, system of vegetables and the family of plants. Um, so, and he also wrote this very long poem called The Botanic Garden. And he had three motives in doing this. The first was to enlist the imagination under the banner of science and to induce the ingenious to cultivate the knowledge of botany. And thirdly, to introduce readers to the immortal works of the celebrated Swedish naturalist Linnaeus. Um, so this time was clearly designed to appeal to women interested in botany. botany. And there's lots of, we have lots and lots of evidence for women being interested in botany and indeed all aspects of natural philosophy, of philosophy as it was called at the time. Um, but again, Erasmus had a particular interest in female edu education. Two of his illegitimate daughters were set up a school um, to educate young women. And he recommended that these young women should learn botany, chemistry, mineralogy, and shorthand, and that they should get lots of outdoor exercise. Um, so that is in our Drawn from Nature case. Um, upstairs, on the metronine level, where we, the uh, cases cover the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, we have a case called Imagining Nature, which serves the same purpose. But in this case, what we're looking at is how individual designers, um, like Christian Dior, um, Philip Tracy, um, have responded to, um, to the world we live in, uh, whether that's the sheer pleasure of actually being outside and feeling the wind in your face, or concerns about um, global warming, uh, in a dress by Alexander McQueen, or here in an outfit by Christopher Kane, who's a Scottish designer. Uh, this was an incredibly important collection for him. Um, he was actually not drawing directly on Linnaeus, but Linnaeus via um, people like Christopher Dresser. And the, um, the print um, alongside the, the garment um, is a Dresser print. And Dre Christopher Dresser used these prints um, when he was teaching students uh, about design 
um, a good divine, but also looking at um, nature again as source material. And again, we, we have the, the uh, division of the plant into stamen and pistils. The lily flower is divided up into stamens and pistils. And Christopher Kane um, went back to Scotland and he went to his old school and he saw um, a diagram very much like this, still in the science labs, exactly where it had been when he was a student. And he was inspired by that to think more about it. And of course, he was intrigued, as was, um, we know Linnaeus was, um, by the comparison between the sexual anatomy of women and the sexual parts of plants. And Kane was certainly looking, looking at that. But he also said, we live because of flowers and trees. They produce oxygen, but we take them for granted. Um, now, one of my challenges, as I said, was to keep nature in the exhibition, keep reminding ourselves um, where materials come from. Um, and we've done that partly with a soundscape, which I'm really pleased about. Um, and the soundscape uh, merges the sounds of uh, well, the dawn chorus when you go in, but then every single animal and bird that you hear after that is in the exhibition, but unfortunately dead, used for fashion. Um, and we've merged those noises of the living animals um, and birds alongside noises of human activity, of water wheels, and then of looms, and then machete cutting down um, trees in the uh, forests in the tropics. Another way we've done it is by working very closely with our advisors at the Natural History Museum and uh, the Museum of Economic Botany at Kew. Um, and so in one case on the ground floor, um, we look at uh, sea silk. Um, and on your, uh, I'm not very good on left and right, but on this side of the screen, uh, we have um, a, a mollusk. Um, sorry, it's on, on your right, isn't it? Yes, on your right, we've got um, a mollusk shell um, from the Pinna Nobilis. And the Pinna Nobilis was described by Linnaeus um, in 1758 in the 10th edition of his Systema Naturae. And we are still, quite correctly, using um, his uh, genus of Pinna and then Nobilis as the um, sub secondary name. Uh, so I don't know if you know about sea silk. Um, it was slightly squeezed into the exhibition. It was hardly commercially produced, um, but I knew my visitors wouldn't forgive me if they didn't see things like this. Um, but why I included it was, I uh, had a, one good reason, was that um, during the 19th century, of course, there were administrators and explorers working throughout the empire, and they were continually bringing new materials back to Britain to see if we could commercially exploit them. Uh, our economy was, was absolutely based around importing raw materials and exporting finished goods in the 19th century. And I did find one comment in a newspaper saying that uh, they thought that um, sea silk, which comes from the beard of this mollusk shell, had potential and that somebody should be looking at dredges used for pearl fishing and then perhaps we could dredge for pearls and dredge for sea silk at the same time. Uh, so these extraordinary fan-shaped shells are found in the Mediterranean and Adriatic, and um, they, they bury the point of the shell in uh, the uh, sandy seabed or occasionally onto rocks, and they secure themselves with a beard, just like a beard on a mussel shell. And so people found that if you... Um, you could utilise the beard to, to spin and to knit um, very fine fabrics from it. And it was called the silkworm of the sea. And this, this um, hardly a trade, but this practice of using the beard of silkworms was particularly focused in um, Sicily, Sardinia, uh, and the Taranto area. And there's one woman left in Italy now who's very famous, and you can easily find her on the web, and she is still fishing for... Um, in in Sardinia. And the, um, the silk was made into gloves and stockings and muffs. And the glove in the exhibition, the pair of gloves in the exhibition was donated to us um, in the early, early, um, 19th, early 20th century, but apparently brought back from Italy in the 19th century. And the color is extraordinary. It's this kind of maroon, reddish brown uh, to gold and sometimes a greenish color. Um, and in 1858, it was described even then as being very scarce. Now, if you were to go to the Natural History Museum and make an appointment there, you could see some 18th century gloves made of sea silk, and they are in the phone collection, the phone, uh, yes, hand phone collection. 
Um, even upstairs, when I was in my imagining nature case and gave in to uh, what I think is a rather stylish handbag by Gucci, which you probably think is quite dreadful, um, but I was quite intrigued by this handbag because um, with its fox head buckle, um, all fake, of course, but it looks back to 19th century, early 20th century styles, and these wonderful embossed beetles, stag beetles. But I recognized immediately that the beetles um, came from uh, Thomas Moffat, the Theatre of in Insects, a 17th century book on natural history, which was very popular with um, uh, pattern drawers <coughs> uh, looking for embroidery motifs um, at that time. And again, we've displayed alongside it a pair of stag beetles, male stag beetles with their antlers from the Natural History Museum. And again, we have uh, Linnaeus, um, uh, categorizing uh, the stag beetle at the get with the genus Lucanus and then uh, Fairwolf or Chairwolf, uh, the stag uh, part of the secondary name. Uh, we've had a lot of support from fellows. Now, Glenn Benson, who is not here, um, but I'm sure will watch me online, and who is the person who really persuaded me that I ought to agree to do a lecture here if I have asked, um, he, uh, he introduced me to a lot of his fellows, and uh, he introduced me to Ms. Uh, Pat Morris, who has a very interesting collection of taxidermy. And I went to see Pat, and I had a rather, we had a very interesting afternoon. Um, and I was particularly interested in borrowing a stoat. Um, when I called it an ermine, he was very disapproving and said, no, it's a stoat in its winter coat. So here we have a stoat in its winter coat, which he very kindly lent to us. Um, and it is in its, uh, it was a taxidermist specimen by Roland Ward. Uh, so what is it doing in this exhibition? <clears throat> this is the first dress you see when you go into the exhibition. Uh, you need eye-catching things in exhibitions because if you don't have eye-catching things, people walk straight past them and they don't read a word you've written. So um, anyway, so the whole point of having this dress was that it was a bit of a showstopper. It's a type of dress worn at the Royal Court in Britain by people of the rank and privilege to attend court. Um, it's a very fossilized style. Uh, women didn't go around wearing these things normally. Uh, it's 175 centimeters wide at the hem, so it's quite, you'd have to learn how to move in these garments. Um, but it does enable you to show off some fantastic fabric. And this woman rather went to town. So she was definitely living in England and going to court in London, but the silk was woven in Lyon. And I had a research budget for the exhibition. I spent a lot of it doing analysis. Um, and so we were able to analyze exactly where everything on her dress came from. Uh, and so it did come from around the globe. So it has metal threads in it, and the silk and gold probably came from Bolivia, from the Potosi mines. Um, the dyes, one of the dyes came from the Caribbean or South America. The other dyes came from Europe. Uh, it's trimmed with the tails of stoat. Um, around the bodice, which would have come from Russia, the Baltic, or the north of North America, what we now know, know as Canada. It's lined with linen, which would have come from Europe. Uh, so it is indeed a dress of global proportions. And also, if you were in the know in the 18th century and lived in Paris, you would know exactly when this silk came out. So it had built-in obsolescence. You could say, 1763, we're now 1765, my dear, how can she get away with it? Um, so already we have a global network supporting fashion, we have built-in obsolescence at the elite level, um, and we have pollution. So the river in Lyon was polluted by dyes and polluted by uh, the, cleaning me the methods of cleaning silk at the time, but of course it's on a very small scale. Um, but I, my, my ermine tails on the dress are quite difficult to see. Um, they are there because the pattern incorporates bands of ermine, which was very prestigious, of course, being associated in Britain with the royal family. <coughs> and I, I needed to draw people's attention to that. So that's why he's flying through the air. He's a flying stoat up by her body, so you can put the two together. And then I wanted to really show people what things were made of. So from the Economic Botany Collection in Kew, we borrowed the dyes. Uh, so they're all plant dyes, and they're in the lovely Victorian glass jars. And then we borrowed um, silkworm eggs and um, larvae and cocoons from the Sands Museum to show the cycle of the silkworm. And it's amazing with our younger visitors how people just don't know what silk comes from. So I think it's quite important. And the portrait behind shows a fashionable woman uh, wearing a stole, um, which is a, um, it's a, it's an ermine stole, 
uh, which is lined with uh, yellow silk. So we're very grateful to Pat for lending that. Um, he also lent us some uh, stuffed birds. So this is a rather gloomy slide. Um, it's quite difficult to take photographs in the gallery. Uh, this is a corner of, the, um, of a case in the next section, which looks at the 19th century, uh, which is my specialist period, and it was a time uh, when the textile industry was hugely important to Britain. Um, it caused significant environmental and social pro problems in places like Manchester and Bradford. Um, but also, Britain was a great entrepreneur. Uh, we had thriving docks. Um, we had significant fur sales, along with Leipzig and uh, Russian cities. <coughs> Excuse me. And we also uh, were the world's leading place for feather sales. We had many feather sales with feathers and birds and bird parts coming in from around the world um, to be uh, often to be re-exported. And I wanted to convey some sense of the quantity. And in a draw in Pat's house, I came across a whole drawer full of um, little green hummingbirds and asked whether I could borrow them. And I think he was slightly astonished by this request. Anyway, I just wanted to convey the kind of quantity. And it was millions of birds, I promise you, that were coming in. So we borrowed 20 hummingbirds from him. But I've noticed people do stop and look at them. And that's what we need. We need them to read the caption. And he also lent a very handsome egret plume. Um, so egrets were uh, called osprey. Uh, euphemistically in the fashion trade, and um, the, uh, trapping, well, they weren't trapped, but getting the feathers, uh, result, the feathers had to be uh, obtained from the parent birds when they were breeding. And so the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds ran a huge campaign to try and stop women, particularly wearing egrets, because once the male and female, the parent birds were being killed, the chicks were just left to die. Um, and I think in the background of this, you can see a demonstration which they uh, staged in various parts in London over a week, I think, in 1911, with these photographs showing the birds, the, bird, the chicks gradually dying in the nest, uh, to really to bring it home to people. Um, Britain was a great place, I think, for, um, uh, for well, societies and campaigns to protect animals, um, and to protect birds. First of all, animals, um, with the Royal Society for the Protection of Animals, was founded very early in the 19th century, um, Society for the Protection of Birds in 1891. Um, but even in the early 19th century, Jeremy Bentham was arguing for animal rights. Um, and the first um, animals to be protected in England were domestic cows uh, to be protected against cruelty. Um, so I've also had lots of IDs, because I kept on saying to Glenn, I'm sure I know what these plants are, but I can't quite think. So he was very helpful. And he put me in touch with John David, who I, has been extremely kind and tolerant. And this was one of the last requests I've sent through to John. Oh, I had another um, exhibit in the Drawn from Nature, the 18th century, imagined by nature, inspired by nature case. Uh, and I had to find a quick substitute. And this is... A, the pocket of a very, very beautiful French um, waistcoat. It's absolutely typical of French waistcoats at the time. Um, and the, pa the pattern books in Lyon are filled with these floral patterns. Uh, but you can see, as John pointed out to me, you can see vetch, which is there. So it's very stylized vetch, but it undoubtedly is vetch. And of course, a kind of stylized form of corn flour. And the one I'm very intrigued by is that. I'm sure that is something um, identifiable, but um, he wasn't able to help me there. But he was enormously helpful with um, this item. Uh, this is a handkerchief which I've always, always loved. It's a um, linen handkerchief with linen lace. And it's astonishing what a fine thread you can get from flax. And the lace was made in Honiton in Devon, so it's British. And the, uh, the fern divine was created by Lady Pauline Trevelyan. And she was married to Walter Calverley Trevelyan. And she, they met through the British Association for the Advancement of Science when she was quite young and he was approaching middle age. He was quite a bit older than her. Um, and after they really hit it off. And after the meeting, he was taken back to the vicarage. She was a vicar's daughter to, to admire the fern garden. And they then had a rather nice courtship, which involved fossil hunting and gifts for fossils, and eventually they married. And she retained a lifelong interest in ferns. 
Um, he inherited an estate in Devon, um, in this area where lace was being made, and she was a talented amateur artist and also a very active patron of the Pre-Raphaelites. And she decided that the patterns that the lace makers were being given were just not appropriate to both the restrictions of lace and its possibilities. And she designed this wonderful, wonderful pattern of ferns. Um, and John told me that um, there are at least four identifiable ferns in it. Um, heart's tongue, which you can see in the little uh, graying in the picture, rusty back, male fern, and hard fern. Um, and ferns were particularly interesting to the 19th century public uh, because by this time, geology was an established su subject, paleontology, and people realized that ferns were a, a link to the earliest um, living plants on the planet, uh, so they had great resonance with them. With them. Um, Glenn was enormously helpful in every way possible, hugely enthusiastic, always sending me emails, lots of reading material, and I'm very, very grateful to him. Um, I found this train very early on in, the, uh, in our collection. I spent many happy days going through drawers. There's nothing like going through drawers of material rather than relying on databases. Um, and I just love the pattern because it's like you've been into a cutting garden and you cut roses, and as Glenn pointed out, the larkspur or consolida, and you've arranged them on your table and you're going to create a lovely flower arrangement with them. So they are laid out like specimens. And they look particularly fantastic against the black satin ground. Um, so we used this train. So, so originally it was part of an, of, a, of an afternoon or evening ensemble. So there was a bodice which was not given to us, um, a skirt and the train. And they were given by Sir Henry Tate, the uh, fourth baronet, um, in 1950. And... Um, we wanted to, we also tried to create marketing posters for our exhibitions, and we wanted something that conjured up this light and dark, this kind of bittersweet relationship, so the huge creativity fashion gets from the world around us, and the pleasure that we can get, or I get, from looking at a garment like that, and, and the thoughts it brings into my head, um, but also how destructive it is, and how exploitative. Uh, somebody said it plunders the world. Um, and so we worked with an Australian photographer called V Spears, and she came up with this rather kind of mixed image of the kind of skull on the head of the model. Now, the model is, uh, she is not wearing the train, I hasten to add. We would never, ever allow anybody these days to wear any of our garments. So it is photoshopped onto her, as were the um, plants, other plants growing over her body. Um, it was actually worn by um, Caroline Hill Rigby Tate. She was uh, the donor's grandmother, uh, she was the wife of William Henry, the second baronet. So the Tates, of course, were the big sugar family. Um, they were all very keen on gardening. Uh, one of, um, some of them exhibited at the Royal Horticultural Society. Uh, I don't think this family did, but they had big gardens in Liverpool. They had a house called Highfield in Walton in Liverpool. And they owned a country estate at Hallam, at Hall Hall yeah, I think it's Hallam in Denbyshire. Um, and... Uh, our slim of our model of Caroline was rather large, and she really was quite Victor Queen Victoria size. Um, but I did find a lovely picture of her in the garden, all dressed in black, um, very Queen Victoria-like, and I could just imagine her in this. Now, how to date it was a problem for me, and I consulted with colleagues in archives uh, because the family said it was British woven silk from Spitalfields, which is possible. Um, but we haven't found the pattern yet for probably Spitalfields or Lyon. Um, but it does seem, because of the technique used, um, which is used to delineate the roses um, particularly, that it must date between about 1895 and 1903. So why was it kept? Uh, so I shouldn't really specu speculate, but I'm going to do. So in 1896, there was a massive double wedding in the Tate family. So two Tate daughters married two brothers from a family called Gossage, to whom the Tate family was already related by marriage. So there's a wonderful description in one of the Liverpool newspapers about this fantastic um, uh, family gathering, and it describes everybody's clothing as far as I could see, apart from Caroline Tate. Anyway, I'm just imagining that possibly she might have commissioned it. Uh, it doesn't have a dressmaker's label in it, but it's custom-made. Uh, she might have commissioned it for this very, very important family celebration. And it would have been very appropriate, of course, with the roses, which are a symbol of love and summer. Um, so it's a, a very, very beautiful garment. Um, I also benefited, finally, from uh, your blog. Um, so I, um, 
My favorite dress in the exhibition in the contemporary section, uh, which is also in uh, this case about imagining nature, um, is this dress by Giles Deacon. And it's seen here worn by Gwendolyn Christie, who is Giles' partner. And Giles is, um, I've known him for a long time. He now specializes in couture in London. Um, and as soon as I saw the egg dress, I knew I wanted it. Um, I partly like it. Well, I like bird eggs. Uh, and I partly like it because I love the caprice of the, bird, the eggs just suspended in space so they'll never drop and smash. And of course, bird eggs are very beautiful. Um, he promptly told me uh, that uh, he got the um, pattern from a very much used and much loved book by Arthur G. Buckler uh, called Birds, Eggs of the British Isles, which was published in 1904. Um, and armed with this information, I went to see my friend at Natural History Museum, Tring. So Douglas uh, Russell is the curator of Birds, Eggs. So he was as excited as I was. And he said, actually, some of these eggs still exist. They're still in collections. So we thought, yes, let's try and get the real egg from the dress, but we, that proved impossible. So in the end, Douglas put together this lovely little box of guillemot eggs. Um, and he, Giles used six plates um, from the book, um, including plate 22 of guillemot eggs and plate 23 of the great auks eggs. And there is the great auks egg. And that egg is in the collection, I think, at Harvard in the States. So if I had much more money, I might have got that, but I couldn't. Um, now, I'm getting to the point gradually. So guillemot eggs, I was looking at guillemot eggs online, and I came across um, a blog about a display here called Bird's Eggs, a display on the history of egg collecting. And it illustrated this page from a book um, to try and attract the reader's attention. And the blog pointed out to me how interesting to ornithologists guillemot eggs are because of their pointed shape. And there's still discussion about why they're so pointed and have evolved to be so pointed. And their extraordinary patination. And indeed, Douglas is a great, very, very interested in guillemot eggs. Um, so that was very useful. Um, but what I was really intrigued by was when I was told that the dress was called the Fabergé imperial gown. And I just thought this is wonderful because what Giles is saying here is that these birds' eggs on this dress are just as precious as those 50 imperial Easter eggs that uh, Fabergé made for the imperial royal family between 1885 and 1916. So the birds' eggs are just as precious as those gold, bejeweled creations of man. Thank you.